Um, we risk that the weak state cannot afford to push any hard bargaining pace, but may only you know, uh, rely on soft bargaining strategies. Uh, so, uh, when, when you look at South Caucasus, it is becoming obvious that there is a uh, th three, three states that are not only pursuing contrasting foreign policies, but there is also two states that are engaged in military confrontation, uh, at least before 2020. They have managed to conduct uh, what I call a lower level of power game. Um, in, in, in many cases, when we define the small states now, it is mostly based on chaotic uh, aspects of, of, of the definition, predominantly based on the qualitative parameters of behavior, uh, such as uh, Vivas and other scholars' approach that in the dyadic relationship, uh, the small state is the weak side of the asymmetric relationship with the, with, the, with the stronger side. But what if we have two small states, two, two states that can be qualified as small, having in a ostensibly symmetric relationship and are engaged in power game, not only in power game, but also in open political military confrontation. It is important to note here that uh, after 2008, uh, since uh, the unipolar order of international relations has started to decline, uh, gradually uh, being substituted by multipolar uh, parameters of international relations, there, uh, there were some bubbles of international community started to rise uh, and gaining the feature of non-Western borders. And so the Caucasus are, is one of them, um, having, having different type of interactions, alliances, confrontations, and conflicts between different and different type of states engaged at the same time. So the question of, my, of this research was, uh, how we can typify Armenia and Azerbaijan as small state. Uh, and I came to the uh, formulation of a um, type of conduct which is not about to generalize any, any aspect of the behavior of some distinct state, to give some sense on how the non typical, from the perspective of, for example, if it's vital, uh, uh, non-typical states can be defined within the category of small states. Uh, and and uh, as, as Rostein reminds us in this case, there, are, there is not only a serious differences between large and small states or small powers, but also vast and, and distinct differences between small, small states itself. So, um, Small power conducting, the case of the Caucasus states, are quite distinct if we consider uh, the period of equation from 2008, we can identify that the two countries were engaged in open military confrontation and in contrast to the assumptions of some uh, theories that apply to, to the conclusion of what, what, what I mean, the small states means. Two sides, two, two countries are very well capable of developing offensive capabilities. Uh, in addition to that, both small states in the Caucasus exercise uh, several, several types of military uh, cater uh, in, order to, uh, in order to exercise power at expense of one another. Um, in, in this case, it is also um, reasonable to note that, that the paradigmatic case of Armenia and Azerbaijan here has uh, a lot to do with uh, the uh, theorizations about power, which traditionally have been seen as something that is, should be considered as prerogative for, for larger powers like middle powers or great powers. Uh, the connotation of such distinct paradigms 
exemplified by Armenia and Azerbaijan can be referred to as unsatisfied state behavioral model. The strategy of which are, or were, to be precise, mostly correspond to what Vital Im implicitly said that could with their intentions uh, to alter the external environment on the map. So, in other words, we have two countries that behave in, from 2008 and 2020 in a way uh, using uh, the military capabilities, using the diplomatic assets, not only the hard uh, power uh, means, but also soft power means, to uh, impose uh, agenda setting at the expense of the diet's uh, interests and positioning in the region. Um, there are two definitions discussing the session, which is, one of, which, which is part of the traditional uh, study or investigation of the state capacities. But in this particular, in this particular study, I, uh, the point of departure of, of mine was how these two states being in relatively symmetric position between one another exercise and project influence and power uh, in their in their uh, in their relationship. It was important to note that uh, since at least 2018, uh, both sides have overtly managed to prepare their military capabilities. And there were open stated t statements that from one side or another that both uh, are engaged in active deterrence, which is something that can be referred to the larger powers, not small state. Now, in the, in the aspect of bad relationship, uh, and in the, in the, in the aspect, on the aspect of uh, our base investigation of two small states that behave differently from the vast majority of small or other small countries. It is obvious to uh, identify uh, that the distinct features in their diplomacy in terms of soft power implementation towards one another. For example, in Armenian case, it is largely considered. Uh, I mean, diaspora is largely considered as important tool. In case of Azerbaijan, it is the energy diplomacy that uh, Azerbaijan conducted for, for decades. Uh, and obviously, uh, constructing its foreign policy against, uh, I mean, towards mitigating Armenia's influence in the region. Thank you, Dr. Oralnia. We will pass the floor to Archie uh, Sikharulidze, a PhD candidate in social sciences from Tbilisi State University, Georgia. He will uh, talk about Georgia and between Turkish Russian cooperative rival. Okay. Should I go there? Okay. The floor is yours. The floor is Can I ask please to turn on my presentation? I will be short because I know that we are all are extremely tired and me too. You have two minutes actually. Yeah, I have like, I think I will like, it will last five minutes. Can, can I ask please to turn off my, yeah. Can you enlarge it because I don't see myself and no one sees. Thank you. So, uh, I will not go into, uh, into the depth of my methodology theory, I will be more practical. And as usual, we see, we say like the, the last but not, not the least, I will like try to be a, be, a, be a more like case precise. I will be speaking about how to, uh, about the challenge that Georgia is having nowadays, and this is challenge uh, of Turkey and Russia. Can, can you turn the first, please, slide, second one? Yes, so, what's uh, in the wake of Erdogan's 
ruling to more and more people in the West especially are afraid that Turkey can go <clears throat> uh, to, to, to have a bigger distance from the West, from NATO, and there were even talks whether the Turkey can be trusted in the wake of this increase of, how they call it, neo-Ottoman or Turkish policy. Uh, unfortunately, nowadays, Georgian police are unable to see that these changes already happened. Uh, Turkey has been considered as Georgia's strategic ally for years and years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And uh, it's now being sacred in Georgia. You cannot simply criticize Turkey. If you criticize Turkey, you criticize NATO. If you criticize NATO, it means that you are pro-Russian. It means that you are dumb, probably. That is how it works in Georgia, unfortunately. So in Georgia, we have a black and white world. On the one hand, we have the developed, civilized system called the Western family, which we would like to rejoin, not even join, but rejoin, because in Georgia, people argue that Georgia is the oldest European country. I'm not sure whether we can make such statements. I think this is the issue of other research, not mine, because I'm not historian. But <clears throat> in scope of this framework, there is the second part of the world where actually Armenia is nowadays, which is not the Western world. And those the, for, for Georgia, it means that you are pro-Russian. So the, the Georgian political system splits everyone on two parts, like pro-Russian and pro-Western. And criticizing NATO, uh, Turkey means criticizing NATO, as I said, and it means that you are pro-Russian. So you simply cannot criticize Turkey in any way. And during the Nagorno-Karabakh war, you were also, everyone was silent about the Turkey's role because of being afraid of called pro-Russian. And uh, this is not the problem with political elites. This is generally the problem with everything in Georgia. Because as I always argue, Georgia is a small country. And as a small country, its academia is all, also extremely politically and ideologically motivated, especially when it comes to political science. And unfortunately, but since the, Soviet, the collapse of the Soviet Union, Georgia's academic life is still not independent from politics. On the other half side we have Russia. Russia which is primordial enemy of Georgia and when Georgian academicians in Latvia, Litva, Estonia, Poland, America speak, they usually speak about 200, 300 years of occupation even though they don't look into the term of occupation and whether they can use this term occupation and uh, those, uh, for Georgia, NATO is the only way to be integrated to the Western world. So far, when the Erdogan put in bromance, if you can call it, the, 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 what I call cooperative rivalry, and this is actually cooperative rivalry, on the one hand we have cooperation, on the other hand we have rivalry, puts Georgia to the difficult situation. Can we trust modern Turkey or we can't? And if we can't trust Turkey, if Turkey is distancing itself from the West, then what is the way Georgia can attach itself to the Europe? That's why Georgian Putkin uh, academic elites are very keen to speak about readiness to, to, to want to go to Ukraine, in 2018, they were even speaking about the Armenian case to go to Armenia and help build, build new Armenia, pro-Western Armenia, Armenia that will distance itself from Russia and go to America, go to the West. But as soon as they realize that Gimbrun military base will never go anywhere, they stop these talks because Armenia stayed in the, the so-called pro-Russian bloc. So, what we see nowadays is a rivalry between cooperation and the rivalry between Turkey and Russia. On the one hand, 
both countries are interested in keeping this region under their control. So for the first time for centuries we see Turkey coming to the region thanks to the Nagorno-Karabakh war. On the, one, on the other hand, we see military bases in Tsikhinwala region of what we call occupied territory of Tsikhinwala region of Abkhazia. And, but on the other hand, we have rivalry because both Turkey and Russia, they don't want to see each other dominating the region. And Georgia is simply just oppressed between these two countries, hoping that the West can change anything. Can you go to the next slide, please? Ah, should I push the button? Okay. Yeah. So, what I would like to say here, and you can just read if, if you don't want to listen anymore. So, Georgia's aspiration to become a member of, of the Western institutions, as I said, to rejoin European families is important meaning that Georgia is the third European country, as a Christian country, as, a, as, a, as Armenia is the first actually, not Georgia, and still, especially NATO, go through Ankara, Turkey, and this is a serious problem for Georgia. Erdogan is a serious problem for Georgia, that they don't want to rise, simply. And it's unfortunate that even in academia, people are afraid of speaking about, speaking about that, because the ambassador of Turkey will say that this is Turkophobia, criticizing the, the Turkey in general by, by all means. It doesn't matter if they criticize anything else, it's Turkophobia. So, uh, despite having strong Turkophobic attitudes among Georgian population, especially it goes to Ajara region, you probably know that thanks to the CARS uh, contract, the Ajara and Batumi went back to Georgia and the people there have a historic memory and they are afraid of Turkey, they are extremely afraid of Turkey. And what the ambassador calls Turkophobic big attitudes are very, very strong there. So, it, per it perceives Turkey as a strategic ally but still does not consider it as a part of the Western civilization. So, it's very interesting that Despite uh, knowing that, to, that uh, Turkey is the only way to the NATO, Georgian people and even the elite do not consider Turkey as a part of the Western civilization. This is just a, 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 a road. And there was a really nice survey during when, when Turkey shut down, um, the, uh, threw down the Russian military, military uh, aircraft, there was a survey asking who will you support if we're going to have war tomorrow and absolute majority was for Russia, not for Turkey. Because even though Russia is enemy, Russia is still the part of the Western civilization for Georgia much more than the Turkey itself. Can you go to the next slide please? Oh, I will, I will myself. And Yes. So, Georgia is not going to join 3 plus 3 format because they say if there is a Russia, we are not going to join it and we have a question. Then what we are doing in OSCE, in UN, I know, yes, thank you, I have 55 seconds. I'm not going to break my deadline. But nowadays they realize that we cannot just step aside from 3 plus 3 format. And plus, if we are smart enough, we can use the 3 plus 3 format as a platform for the West to help control Turkey and to protect our interests. And I will make a small non-paid advertisement of my article that was published uh, at MGIMO by International Analytics that is called Georgia Beyond Radical Europeanist and Discovered Direction of Foreign Policy that discusses this topic. The, uh, there is a really nice article called by Corneli Kakachia where he, where he considers the term of Europeans and this is my rep response to as a radical Europeans. Thank you, it's 10 minutes, I'm done. Next, Mr. Jason Strauss.
Associate Research Fellow and Visiting Lecturer, Politics and Security Program, OSCE Academy, Bishkek. Mr. Jason Strax will virtually discuss engaging with adversaries in the Armenia-Azerbaijan and Israel-Palestinian conflict, positive externalities of minor power rivalry linkages. The floor is yours. Okay, we will skip to Mr. Meher Sahagyan, Doctoral Degree in International Relations, Director of China, Russia Council for Political and Strategic Research, University of Hong Kong. Uh, Mr. Uh, Meher, or Dr. Meher, will discuss China's Belt and Road Initiative Hong and Hong Central Asia. Dear colleagues, at first I want to thank Dr. Ruben Elamilian and Organizing Committee and thank you for the opportunity to testify today about China's Belt and Road Initiative and Central Asia. This is a topic of interest to me as a research journalist. Under Xi Jinping presidency, China piloted towards Russia for its Belt and Road Initiative. It chose to link the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region and Central Asia by announcing the new initiative in Kazakhstan in 2014. Since then, the China Central Asia Western Asia Economic Corridor has become the main tool for China to focus on Central Asia, Middle Eastern, and South Caucasian countries. It is also an alternative main end road to Europe and thus not pass through Russian uh, territory. As a result, China actively invests in developing railroads, highways, ports, uh, and our infrastructure facilities in China Central Asia Western Asia Economic Corridor countries. Kazakhstan is also involved in Silk Road Economic Belt's New Year Russian Land Bridge Economic Corridor and our link from uh, China to Europe traversing through Kazakhstan and, and Russia. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan also became the regional members of Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which China established in 2016 for financing projects of the Belt and Road Initiative. As a result, a formation Central Asian state receives loans from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank for developing their own infrastructure, and after the COVID-19 outbreak, they also got several loans for the improvement of their economic situation. It means that Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank stood at our strategically important financial level for developing infrastructure of Central Asia under the framework of Belt and Road Initiative. Membership of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank has provided an opportunity to Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan to develop their relations with China in multilateral financial organization as well. Let's also speak about Belt and Road Initiatives, Digital Sea Road and, and its role in Central Asia. China and Kazakhstan closely cooperate in the framework of Belt and Road Initiative Digital Sea Road, for which Beijing strives to export its uh, technologies in digital products. China's technological companies such as Huawei, Higvision, Tahua Technology, and China Electronics Technology Group Corporation are involved in building safe cities and data management centers in Kazakhstan. Kazakh and Chinese telecommunication companies closely cooperate in producing and providing Internet things and technologies which are important for digitalization and progress of Kazakh economy. The development of artificial intelligence, 5G technologies, big data by the help of China, also provide an opportunity to Kazakhstan to use them for strengthening its security. Uzbekistan and China are also developing their cooperation under the auspice of Belt and Road Initiatives, Digital Sea Road. Chinese companies such as Huawei, Citic Group, Costar Group and Hink Vision are playing main roles in their capacities of partners of the government of Uzbekistan. Huawei is the most active one, which is also took part in Tashkent Safe City project and in modernization of Uzbek National Telecommunication Network. During his visit to China, President Mirziyoyev had a meeting with Huawei's founder, Enjin Fei, for discussing further cooperation in the development of safe cities, electronic governments, and training of high-quality staff of Uzbekistan by the help of Huawei. This proves the fact that in Sino-Uzbek relations, Chinese technological companies play a key role and create their own influence in Uzbekistan. China's digital sea road is represented in Tajikistan for Huawei. It is, it is involved in Dushanbe's safe city project. 
China's companies such as Huawei, China National Electronics Import and Export Corporation, and IZP Group also play a leading role in digitalization and in big data collection in Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. In turn, Turkmenistan mostly implements digitalization of its economy and develops technologies by the help of Russian uh, organizations. However, China's side sees possibilities for cooperation with Turkmenistan in developing 5G technologies, digital economy, smart city construction, satellite communication, etc. Let's also speak about LC Road uh, relation. Starting from the beginning of outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic, China has actively worked with the Central Asian states in the framework of its Health Seal Road Initiative. If in 2020, China was supplying to regional states mass tests and medicine, uh, medical over equipment, in 2021, China actively distributes its vaccines. Beijing implemented this policy mostly for the following two reasons. First one is that China uses vaccines for strengthening its soft power diplomacy in the region. And the second one is that if this step China creates new market for its medical production. There is a tough competition for Central Asian market where Russia, Russia with its Sputnik V and the West with its several types of vaccines are involved. But till now, China could compete with them successfully promoting Chinese vaccines. So, so speak about China uh, plus Central Asia cooperation mechanism. China also develops its relations uh, with Central Asian states in multilateral level as well without any other great power involvement as it is in Shanghai Cooperation Organization. For this reason, China plus Central Asia cooperation mechanism was created. It appears that China wants to find ways with regional states to promote patent road initiative projects in multilateral level as well. As this kind of strategy will provide an opportunity to China to also play a role of mediator for Central Asian states and be involved in problem solving process in, in regional issues, which from time to time create obstacles for the implementation of Belt and Road Initiative. For instance, last uh, military clashes between Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan create risks for Chinese investments under the Belt and Road Initiative. Through our conclusions and introduce our findings. In sum, China, through its Belt and Road Initiative, has mostly kept its advancement in Central Asia in pre and post COVID 19 eras. Although the outbreak made some problems for the trade. In general, the Silk Road Economics Belts, China, Central Asia, Western Asia, and a new Eurasian Land Bridge Economic Corridors are good for Central Asian states as it helps them to use and modernize their railways, highways, ports, oil and gas pipelines and for them to be connected with Chinese and international markets. Silk Road Economic Belt's China-Pakistan Economic Corridor will stand as another important world of a road for Central Asian states for connecting their economies in South Asia and Middle East when the railway from Kashgar to Pakistani Badar port will be constructed. Here again, Kazakhstan will get great benefits as its railway can be used for connecting Arabian Sea with Europe. China, Kyrgyzstan, Uzbekistan corridor can also play a role of bridge, but existence of only highway in this direction will limit quantity of transportation. Sides must connect railway of the three countries for getting more benefits and strengthening this uh, direction as well. Uh, China's digital sea road opens new prospects for Central Asian states for developing their technologies by the help of the world's second biggest economy, which has achieved remarkable success in research and development and innovation during the last two decades. China and Russia have found modus vivendi and chose cooperation over competition in Central Asia. It is good for Central Asian states uh, as they will not stand as a better fit among uh, their strong neighbors which also includes nuclear weapons. The conjunction of the Russian lead, the Russian Economic Union, and Belt and Road Initiative, which was agreed in 2015, and signation of the agreement of trade and economic cooperation between the Russian Economic Union and the People's Republic of China on May 17, 2018, in New Sultan, also opened prospects for developing Sino-Hazard and sino kyrgyz relation in multilateral levels. Afghanistan will remain as one of the main threats of the Belt and Road initiatives 
infrastructure in Central Asia and Xinjiang. I assume that the U.S. had withdrawn its uh, forces from Afghanistan and had left power to Taliban, that the last one creates problem for China, keeping the entire region in a tense situation and chaos. In this situation, the Shanghai Cooperation Organization will play a crucial role, where China will mostly work with Russia and Central Asian states, also having Pakistan in its side, which has influence on Taliban. But of course, China must be satisfied that the U.S. will not have military base in neighborhood of its western borders. Thus, Beijing will try to bind Taliban with its Belt and Road initiatives, vast financial sources, where it stops training separatists from Central Asia and Xinjiang, and halts spreading fundamental Muslim ideologies in these regions. Thus, having Pakistan in its uh, Belt and Road initiative, China is capable to stabilize Afghanistan, but neither Soviet Union nor the U.S. were able to do. As China's Foreign Minister Wang noted on this issue during the China Plus Central Asia Fire Meeting, China respects Afghan-led and Afghan-owned principle. Thank you. And here is a third slide. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any appearance for Mr. Jason Strix? Okay, we will continue. Our last speaker, Mr. Yaya Tashian, Associate Fellow at the San Fares Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut. He will discuss Lebanon, the mirror of Middle Eastern battleground, the case of Lebanese Armenian community during 1958 crisis, and post 2011 regional development. Thank you. Once again, I would like to thank the organizing committee, and since I'm the last speaker, so I will wrap up. Uh, in his book, Beware of Small States, Lebanon, the Battleground of the Middle East, David Hirsch argues that Lebanon is the battleground where regional and international powers pursue their strategic, political, and ideological conflicts. The first case that I will talk about is the year 1958, where it was a revolutionary year in the Middle East. The region was divided mainly into two camps, the Arab nationalist camp supported by the Soviet Union and also the reactionary monarchist camp which was supported by the U.S. So the 1958 uh, crisis or the mini-civil war sometimes we call in uh, Lebanon was a turning point also for the Lebanese Armenian community. The Armenian political landscape was divided based on ideological, regional and international calculations. Similar to 1958 events, the Arab Spring of 2011 and the rise of Turkey and its military intervention in Syria has also, have also, also affected the Armenian community. With Turkey becoming a regional power, Turkomans and Sunni Muslims in Lebanon were mobilized and organized anti-Armenian protests. So all these developments actually pushed the Armenian community leaders to reposition themselves in the Lebanese politics and try to contain the Turkish influence through their local regional allies. So the following case study will argue how international, regional and local geopolitical factors can shape the political image of a highly politicized uh, diasporan community. The example of the inter-Armenian Cold War and the rise of the Turkish influence in the Middle East and its impact on Lebanon's, Lebanon's political, uh, domestic politics help us to explain how other transnational or supranational politicized communities in Lebanon such as the Armenians, can be influenced by regional and geopolitical developments. So, several factors actually seem to pose a threat to Lebanon's independence starting 1958, uh, such as, for example, the non uh, especially targeting the non-Muslim uh, minorities. These were the symbolic rise of Jamal Abdel Nasser, the president of Egypt back then, the trend of the Muslim opinion toward the Arab unity, and the demands by the Muslims to abolish the political sectarianism uh, in Lebanon. So all these factors actually pushed uh, the former president of Lebanon in 1958, Camille Chamon, to ask for a direct U.S. military intervention in Lebanon under the Eisenhower Doctrine. So the Armenian diaspora in Lebanon as a transnational community was also affected by this Cold War situation. And based on local and regional calculations, the community also was divided between regional and local politics. For example, the Tashkans were allied with the government, the President Kamil Shamoun, and the Americans against the communists, while the other Armenian political parties, such as the Armenian communists, the Ram Gavaz, and the Hemchaks, were allied with the opposition and the Arab nationalists against 
the government and the U.S. policy uh, in the region. Moreover, also there was a crisis of the Armenian Apostolic Church and the Soviet intervention. So all these issues has made the situation of the community much worse. So there were street clashes. In 1958 there was, as I said, a mini-civil war. And it was interesting that although uh, in October 1958 this mini-civil war ended, but the Armenians continued assassinating and killing each other until December 1958 where the Lebanese state pressured the Armenian political parties to stop the violence. So I can say that in, uh, the events of the 1958 uh, shaped the political image of the community and in 1975 when uh, the civil war started in Lebanon which went from 1975 to 1990 the armies didn't participate because they learned the mistakes of 1958 and they adopted a positive uh, neutrality. <coughs> Coming to the second case which is the influence of the let's say the Arab Spring or the winter or the political protests uh, in the Arab region and also the Turkish influence on the Armenian community there. So with the withdrawal of the Syrian military army from Lebanon in 2005 and the eruption of the popular protest movements in the Arab world starting 2011 and the fragmentation of Syria, Turkey asserted the increase in its influence on Lebanon to various Turkish communities residing, residing in the country. The horrors also of the invasion of the Armenian populated town of Kesab in Syria by pro-Turkish militants spread concerns among the Armenian uh, diaspora leaders in Lebanon. This was a scene, I can, I can argue that this was a scene as a direct threat on the Armenian community. So as the Armenian community had always, uh, with its networking system and lobbying efforts, had tried to contain the Turkish influence in the region, it was positioned in a direct conf confrontation with Turkish regional and local policies in Lebanon. The Turkmens and other Turkish communities can be classified as a rising community in Lebanon, but also challenging for declining Armenian community in the country. Ankara pursues three main objectives in Lebanon. First, expanding, expanding its influence with the view of becoming a key player in uh, Lebanon, on equal footing with other regional uh, powers such as Iran, the Saudis, even the Russians and the Americans. The second, containing, the, containing Iran by counterbalancing Hezbollah's influence. And third, securing energy interests in, in the context of recent oil and gas discoveries in the eastern Mediterranean. So to, to pursue this course, actually Turkey is trying to help and even organize the Turkish community in uh, Lebanon. The policy, this policy actually ultimately is clashing with the interests of the traditional Armenian uh, community in the country. It was also interesting that during the centennial of the Armenian Jews in 2015, when each year the Armenian community organizes public events, huge demonstrations, for the first time in 2015, uh, this traditional narrative was also challenged by the Turkmens and the Sunni Muslims in Lebanon where they also organized anti-Armenian demonstrations, publicly also they justified uh, gen the genocide and so on. So hence the Turkmens and the Turkish communities in a way residing in Lebanon started to be viewed as Ankara's voice and an essential means to serve its policies and ambitions thus consolidating Turkey's soft power, I can say, policy uh, in the region. So to conclude, the Armenian diaspora in Lebanon can be viewed as a transnational community that can be influenced by geopolitical regional conflicts. However, the Lebanese complex sectarian system can push such communities, whether Armenians or Turkish, to balance each other through engaging in alliances and lobbying efforts. In the last decade, the Turkmens became much more organized thanks to the Turkish official backing, while the Armenians, despite their shrinking number due to socio-economic factors that Lebanon is now uh, witnessing, still play a traditional power breaker role, especially in Christian areas. Thank you. Okay, if not, we will give uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. Any questions, please? Thank you. Thank you very much for the presentations. They were really interesting. Uh, my question um, could be directed, I think, that almost any uh, participant on the panel side would be happy to hear multiple uh, answers. Uh, so my um, impression was that you conceptualize the great power competition in the region as a negative tendency for small states. 
Nevertheless, uh, I, you know, I don't know much about the regional, geo, regional geopolitical dynamics, but according to the theoretical literature, many small state theorists argue that a uh, situation where, is, uh, where, where, is, where, can, where can be conceptualized as a uh, great power competition, small states can gain leverage in this competition. Naturally, many times this is uh, only works as a trade-off with the uh, security of small states. So can you, uh, would you describe this situation as, uh, uh, I mean, geopolitical competition <coughs> between great powers in the region as uh, a situation in which small states gain leverage um, in expense for, you know, lesser level of, of security, or would you conceptualize it in any other ways? Thank you very much. Okay, thank you for your question. Well, based on your theoretical approach that you mentioned, um, it's like dealing with the banks. To make profit, you need to know how the system works. If you don't know how the system works, you will always lose. Uh, the problem with the Georgia, and I'm speaking about Georgia nowadays, is that Georgian political elites, and this is what we call European, as I said, or what I call radical Europeanness, they're so strictly and solidly attached to the West that they don't want to see anything beyond the West. That is the biggest problem. And every time when we speak about possible uh, further integration with, let's say, Armenia, just let's say, yeah, uh, uh, beyond this notion of brotherhood nation that we have, and in South Caucasia we have this brotherhood nation concept that actually means nothing in practice, uh, nothing is happening. We don't even have. Uh, the limitation process over with Armenia having committee from 1996. The same with Azerbaijan. The only country with, have, with which we have this delimitation process and is Turkey. And only because Turkey is the part of the NATO and it was before Erdogan. That is the problem. If you don't know how, if or I would say, when you refuse to follow the rules of global politics, global politics will strike you back. That is my point, what's going on in Georgia. Georgia is not using possibilities because it hopes that one day it becomes part of the NATO and EU, and EU and NATO will solve Georgia's problem by default. This is extremely big mistake, and it opposes all theoretical frameworks that exist from my standpoint. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentations. Um, and I'm speaking as a, as a person who's, you know, educated and working and researching from a very Western perspective. In, in the West, um, we always perceive this particular region of the world to be heavily affected by culture, not interests. So culture, alliances and culture in, in theoretical terms. So um, many of these presentations suggested um, that culture doesn't really play such a big role, particularly the presentation by our colleague from Georgia, but other presentations as well. So China is engaging in foreign policy um, that takes into account just plain interests, um, the Georgians are sidelining with another country that is at the opposite spectrum of its cultural history and orientation and identity. Um, and I would like to ask you, is, is there a role for, you know, culture in shaping foreign policy? Um, I have many other questions, but I do realize that it's a bit late, but if you could just answer this. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. I mean, when it comes to my presentation, yes, Turkey is uh, pursuing uh, soft power policy towards Lebanon, especially introducing this Turkified culture that is why it is mobilizing, and not just mobilizing, but also organizing a Turkish community in uh, Lebanon. For example, uh, by providing an like PhD scholarship for Muslim students in Lebanon, uh, but these scholarships are limited uh, 
uh, and are selective only for Turkish, mostly Turkish students. Uh, this is very interesting because before 2010, uh, not a single Lebanese heard about the Turkish community in Lebanon. And when Erdogan visited uh, Lebanon, he just found out there is a Lebanese, some Lebanese few thousand, that they are speaking Turkish, and he started to uh, later establish a Turkish uh, cultural center in Lebanon, and maybe later they will try to establish also a Turkish university, so they have a plan. So this is a this is soft power policy that Turkey is, and also Russia is doing the same nowadays in Lebanon, which is very interesting. Thanks. I want to go back to uh, the question of our Hungarian colleague. You know, it depends, but what I know that small states or medium states must play uh, their foreign policy in a way that they do not stand a uh, platform for, uh, as a battlefield for great powers, as it happened in as it happened in Nagorno-Karabakh. It was not also only about the conflict between Azerbaijan and Armenia. It was a um, continuation of uh, competition between Russia and the West in this, in this region and, and, and Turkey is also, uh, we, we must know, and it is not a secret, but Turkey is NATO member and uh, the closest ally of, 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 of the US. So, um, uh, the fact is that, that small states, for instance Armenia, or Georgia as well, or Azerbaijan as well, they must find language with each other. As far as we have some problems with each other, it will be used one day by the US, another day by, 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 by Turkey, another day by Iran, another day by Russia. So we must solve our problems. And uh, Armenia as well, Armenia as well. Uh, our friend from Greece asked about culture. Uh, you know Armenia must find way to solve this problem with Turkey and Azerbaijan. Because without this, we will always be, and uh, we will always stand better fit for, for uh, when Russia and Turkey will have any problem here. And they will have it in future as well. So we must uh, ch uh, change our thinking and find ways uh, and find language we will. And uh, during uh, Mr. Sarkis' um, uh, panel, he was mentioned that uh, he was mentioned that because of uh, geopolitics. If I am mistaken, please uh, correct me. Armenia is in not good location. Armenia has not good neighbors. But uh, sorry, I am not. I am not agree with this. Even if you ask French people, they will say that you know we have problems with Germans. They are not good. Uh, the UK is not so good. Uh, it is about us. We must be changed, and we must find language. We must not uh, wait uh, 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 that uh, our old neighbors be good for us. We must change our attitude and also ask them to change us. But uh, we must uh, we must try. For Georgia as well, what do you gain from, from your conflict with Russia? Nothing. Because of this conflict, you lost your two territories and you have lost trade, trade with Russia. For what? For nothing. About Armenian foreign policy, there are, there are some breathings in Armenia. There are even some politicians and political parties which are speaking about our, that Armenia can stand military ally of, of the US. It, it is not possible, you know, it is not possible. The US has zero interest in Armenia. It is not only about Gyumri basis. The Gyumri basis is here because we have good relations with Russia and we need Russia. And Russia needs us. It is not only about Gyumri basis. And even it is not about Armenian government. Who will be in the power in Armenia? He or she will have good relations with Russia. Uh, till that, that we do not solve our problems with all. But going back to the military alignment with the US, it is not possible, my friends. Uh, because uh, the US has zero interest in Armenia. Because it has in this region, the, U uh, the Turkey and Azerbaijan, uh, the US does not need Armenia. Which political parties in Armenia are speaking about this? They are not understanding what are they speaking about. Do you think that the US does, uh, didn't know about what, is, what must happen in, in Nagorno-Karabakh? They know about it. They know about it. And they were directing Turkey and Azerbaijan. 
Do you think that NATO member can uh, stand its drones or military instructors to the region for attending in war and the US does not know about it? It doesn't, uh, it, it is not possible. So, uh, so the US is interested in Armenia, but Armenia stay as a, uh, as a geographical, geographical name somewhere in, 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 this, in this area. So my message is that, that in, in uh, uh, Caucasus, South Caucasus, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Georgia must solve their problems. And they must help each other. For instance, Georgia maybe can help Armenia to solve its problem with Turkey. Armenia can help and stand bridge where Georgia solve its problems with Russia. So in this way only we can have peace and prosperity in this region. Thank you. Yes, I just want to go back to the culture and to the West. You said it say, shortly. Georgians value two things, three things probably. The first ones tr uh, are traditions. They are very important for Georgians, but it's but it's it's all about family issues. They value church and Christianity because it was it is the most strong institution that existed for centuries. And the third one is that I I like really 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 formulation that was used by published by Guardian when dis discussing what people in Eastern Europe ex expected after the breakup of the Soviet Union it was really well formulated to live normal life in a normal country by the end of the day so especially for young and for me as a generation of millennium for me the, the most important is not charge traditions for my family it's to live a normal life and if it isn't if I'm pretty sure if Georgia will be like given a, a chance to live a normal life in a normal country with Turkey they will agree on that because that is the main priority of Georgians we are all extremely tired of this continuous war. When people say that Georgians value traditions, they usually mean here like making money or something like that, like pity corruptions, but, but what do they really value is a peace, stability, and to live a normal life. That's why we, and I agree, that we can use, and unfortunately I don't see this, we can use Georgia as a platform for peace. Because in Georgia we have Armenians, Azeris, all living together in peace. Peace is what Georgians value the most. Before I, go, before I give you the floor, just give me two minutes to reply on Mr. Sargyan. Uh, as I mentioned in my paper, that the biggest opportunity for a small state is the fact being located in a region of great geopolitical importance with a lot of problems. So I do agree what you were trying to say. And if you take, uh, if you take a look at the results of uh, the war with uh, Azerbaijan, there was a failure. So I do insist that we need to have a kind of cooperation, starting maybe economic, reaching to military. So uh, I'm not opposing what you said. Uh, this was very clear what I was trying to mention and in the end we all try to search diplomacy and peace for, uh, for our kids and our families. Thank you. Is it good? Yes. I have a question about, uh, uh, about the Chinese um, regional policy. Uh, I would like to uh, do you have any, uh, to you, Mr. Saikan, do you have any information about the uh, conceptual uh, approach of China toward the South Caucasia, like to the Central Asia, or maybe it's more peripheral for them? And uh, my uh, replica, let's say, uh, toward the uh, conciliation or solving problems, you know, it's like tango, you, you cannot dance tango alone. You have, uh, you should have partners. So if we have partners with the same interests, why not? But now 
it's broken. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, if we speak about uh, China's involvement in the South Caucasus region, we can mention that, as I know, China has made uh, investments in uh, Georgia for several hundred millions. They have established their joint uh, bank in Georgia. They are, uh, uh, there are also many other investments in production and also seven or eight hundred million uh, USD China invested in, 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 in uh, Azerbaijan and uh, here we must also mention about Baku to BDC cars railway actually, actually China is using this connection uh, I have uh, mentioned about China, Central Asia, Western Asia uh, economic corridor so in these corridors uh, the railway is uh, coming to Aktau port or to Membashi port. They are in, in, the, in the Caspian Sea. And after they are sending these goods, containers, over. You are. And after uh, they are sending it to Baku port. And after this, uh, uh, by railway, by Baku uh, Tbilisi Cars railway, it is going from Turkey to Europe. So in this connection, uh, Azerbaijan is playing important role and, and the Georgia as well. So in this regard, if we compare it with Armenia, Armenia is not playing any role and there is no any, any investments in Armenia. Armenia could not use this opportunity. Armenia would like to speak about that it has memorandum of understanding with China in 2015, but after 2016, uh, in Armenian-Chinese relation, uh, there is a stagnation period, and there are no any investments, there are no any activity in this in this policy. And you know, uh, it is making some risk as well. Uh, if we have Tur uh, Turkey and Azerbaijan, they are actively working with China in the framework of Belt and Road Initiative, and of course, uh, they are getting also upper hand. Uh, they have voice in Beijing. So for this reason, they can even after if Armenia continues its uh, its policy without any result with China, uh, the infrastructure of Belt and Road Initiative can be uh, uh, can be used against Armenia. Thanks for your answer. I hope I asked for it.